Welcome to another AIA Colorado Virtual Connect with our co-host, Noma Colorado. Today, we're bringing you a little something different. I'm proud to introduce the first of what I hope is a long partnership between AIA Colorado and Noma Colorado, the newly formed local chapter of the National Organization of Minority Architects. Since this is a joint presentation, I'm joined here live today by Anisha Street, one of the founding members of Noma Colorado. Anisha, want to tell folks what we've got in store for them today? Thank you, Mike. Um, I am very thrilled to be here representing Noma Colorado. And in, in terms of creating um, this particular partnership with AIA Colorado, um, for today's session, we're going to guide you, our guests, um, through authentically creating a culture of belonging in architecture. And this does not have to, uh, you know, sort of distinguish your role. It's whatever role that you are involved in the field of architecture, we want to be able to talk about how we might create that culture. Um, so the discussions today will address some challenges we have in cultivating firms and individuals who are more agile, um, uh, just behaviors, diverse, inclusive, and equitable uh, behaviors. In Colorado, we are seeing an all-time high graduation rate of minority students. At CU Denver, um, in the College of Architecture and Planning, where I am an assistant a professor, minority students make up 60% of graduates, um, yet firms in Colorado do not exactly represent that, um, and it's not really represented nationally or globally. Um, so we'd like to be able to talk about um, those specific aspects of diversity there. Um, when we think about the culture and actually specific to our culture of, of you know, being in the field of architecture, there's a, a desire to belong as well as to fit in, and I say that in quotes, <laughs> and to be a member of the uh, community. But moreover, as individuals, we are trained in a common profession um, we share a bond and we can, we can become like-minded. Um, there's a desire to share experiences and commonalities, but yet the same desire can lead to a homogeneity rather than true diversity. So we really want to understand within this architecture profession, um, and which we all know, <laughs> we come with very specific and special talents and skills and experiences backgrounds um, that can really, really contribute to how we can make our profession a really rich and strong, diverse profession. Yeah, and we want to focus today not on the negative, but the positive that comes from the web of mutuality that exists among all of us. And so uh, that's what we're aiming to do and working together. The AIA Colorado Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee and Noma Colorado have assembled a diverse group of architects today to discuss how we can organically integrate diversity and inclusion into our practices. Uh, it's been one of our imperatives since uh, last year as a board of directors to foster a culture of belonging, and this is part and parcel of that. We trust you'll be mindful as a participant of the AI Code of Ethics. We ask you to be respectful as we create a safe space that at times may venture into uncomfortable territory. All right. So before we get started today, there's some uh, terminology that we'd like to to share and perhaps introduce um, some new words that you may not have heard of. And you will be hearing those terms throughout today's um, discussion. Um, so right now you'll be seeing um, uh, these terms on your slides, I'm sorry, on your screen. Um, so you may have heard or may not have heard words like tokenism, hypervisibility, hyper intersectionality, respectability politics, and so we'd like to just invite you to take a moment to, to look at these words, absorb um, these words. Some of it you may have heard already, um, but really want to sort of table these terms as you will be here in um, these terms uh, mentioned today. Well, thanks, Anisha. During the webinar, uh, the participation is of course open to you as well. So I encourage you to use the chat box to ask questions and a reminder that AIA members will receive one and a half AI CES learning units for participating in today's hour and a half webinar. Okay, let me share who's joining us today. Uh, but before we get there, um, we'd like to ask you a question. Uh, you'll see on your screen two attendee poll questions. Um, and this is just to get a sense of 
who's in the room today, virtually. Uh, the first is how do you identify in terms of gender representation? And the second is how do you identify in terms of racial and ethnic diversity? So while you're answering that, I'll tell you who we've got as our, you know, we're days away from the all-star game in Major League Baseball. We are doing a preview of that with the all-stars of equity, diversity, and inclusiveness between AIA and Noma, Colorado. So first up today is Giselle Santos Rivera, AIA Noma. Giselle is the firm-wide director of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, a medical planner and vice president of HKS Inc. We also have with us David Allen, Noma. He's an architectural designer with Roland and Broughton. And Sarah Aziz. Sarah is the incoming Jedi visiting professor at CU Denver College of Architecture and Planning. Jeremy Fretz, AIA NCARB, is the Assistant Vice President, Experience and Education at the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards. And we're bringing back my co-anchor, Anisha Street, who will be moderating today's discussion. She is a visiting assistant professor at the CU Denver College of Architecture and Planning, educate co-chair for the National Organization of Minority Architects, and a founding board member and parliamentarian of their local chapter here in Colorado. So without any further ado, I want to welcome all of our panelists and uh, say hi, and we're glad you're here. And we're going to turn it over to Anisha to moderate our conversation. All right. Thank you, Mike. So to begin the conversation, we'd like to start with, um, you know, what I like to think about is the, the source of the profession. Uh, being a professor um, in academia, um, I have a very, you know, sort of strong um, uh, sort of will to, to to make sure that as we start to to um, uh, groom and, and educate our students to to um, transition into the profession, we need to make sure that we you know address um, certain items at the at at the you know the the academic institution level, so that when we do go out into practice. A lot of those things are already, um, you know, sort of established in terms of how we might be, you know, sort of very successful in contributing to the field. And so, as we mentioned, um, graduation rates among minorities are at an, an all time high. And this is specifically speaking at CU Denver alone. And so, I'd like to um, first um, invite my uh, a colleague, <laughs> she's become a colleague <laughs> of mine, Ms. Sarah Aziz to um, discuss uh, some of the, you know, some of the, the issues that she may see around how we might start to address academia and how we might uh, begin to think about how we start to matriculate students into the uh, profession. So um, as we mentioned, at CU Denver alone, the minority graduation rates are at an all-time high, um, and that is 60%. And I'd like uh, Sarah to speak to um, you know, what has helped uh, contribute to this uh, demographic shift? And then more, more importantly, why are we not quite seeing this um, in firms today? And I, I, I want to be clear that, you know, we, we are still, we're still speaking about um, skills, experiences, backgrounds, talents, everything that we see our students can bring to the profession. Um, so even though we are talking about this conversation in terms of diversity, all of that is still very much at the forefront of what we're considering in terms of making firms diverse. Sarah? Thank you so much for the um, warm introduction, Mike, and for the incredibly thoughtful question, Anisha. So I want to frame my um, response in the current state of architectural education um, that I've encountered and that I'm currently encountering. And I think a big um, you know, paradigm shift that's happened is that students are now seeing um, practitioners and academic that reflect more of their own identities, that are more diverse. And in doing so, it creates opportunities for us to teach the conflict. We can reimagine the canon and make new possibilities for affect, subjectivity, and identity. And I think it's critical to um, you know, expanding the role the architectural practice has is to ensure that same diversity uh, and you know lack of homogeneity moves into the profession simultaneously you know in academia 
um, because of the diverse bodies of people who are now um, entering into the profession as students, as administrators, as faculty, what's what that's brought to the fore is that people are now engaging with, um, you know, grappling with the question of expertise. What are the forms of expertise that we ascribe value to? How can we expand those? And what new forms of um, analysis or methods of analysis do we begin to um, work with and in doing so you know lastly I think what's super important is that you know we're radicalizing the context of um, architectural studies so that students and um, academics were thinking more expansively more holistically about who gets to uh, enter into the world of design and who is it affecting so by building these larger conversations it exposes students to ways of thinking and making um, that are incredibly rich and you know I must um, you know, state clearly, I don't have a, t a wealth of experience in um, the architectural profession. But, you know, as someone who is actively working towards licensure and is engaging in a number of different building projects, um, it's really important, you know, that we acknowledge the reputation that practice has and the way that we can move away from cultivating the same, you know, perceived problematic habits um, in students. And I think, you know, as a young professional, um, I also encounter a lot of barriers to entry, which I know we'll speak about shortly, but in terms of, you know, the price of admission through AIA, the price of admission through NCARB, um, and, you know, the, the ways in which we work towards obtaining licensure um, can seem prohibitive and undesirable. So I think, you know, the way that our students are being equipped to enter into the workforce, they have accrued, you know, a a wealth of talent that makes them more nimble and agile and able to use their skills and make architecture in a way that circumvents some of the more formal um, um, formal ways that we have um, held as being the most dominant way of becoming an architect. So I think our students acknowledge and see that they, they can do this in a way that circumvents um, the status quo. Thank you, Sarah. That was uh, very poignant. I'd like to, um, you know, also just uh, uh, um, echo and, and support you also in, in um, everything that you said, but I want to really sort of call out, you mentioned um, just even the way we are trained to think and make, I believe at the most elemental level of our profession, if we can start to realize that we can foster even diversity, even at that level, Right. Um, as architects, we know when we engage with clients or even if we're, at, you know, students working on a particular site. Right. There's so many things we have to deal with. Those things are, are all elements of diversity. And so I, I really, really want to to um, just sort of bring it back to sort of the, just the most elemental level of how we even begin to to train students in the field and we could use those to sort of foster this behavior that we're wanting to see become a trait of the profession. So thank you for saying that. Um, uh, another thought um, that also came up, but uh, if you would speak to, and you, you started speaking to it, is the, the, the current state of um, higher education um, in architecture relative to geography. Um, you also started to speak about the barriers that we may face in terms of entry into not just the field, but even entry into architecture education. And then um, just sort of your overall uh, uh, perspective and take on the, the relationship between academia to the profession. Thank you, Anishia. So in terms of um, the geographical ramifications of people being able to access architectural spaces of architectural learning, um, I think it's highlight to, um, important to highlight, you know, new uh, pedagogical um, systems that are emerging, such as Dark Matter University, that is trying to decentralize um, education, learning, and make spaces of learning available and accessible to anyone and everyone. And I think, you know, the more that we can move, um, you know, the university out into the landscape and to build dialogues that in, um, encompass all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds and ask our students to become active agents and critical in trying to initiate and sustain conversations, but allow them to learn from firsthand experience, the more um, students become 
equipped to really ask critical questions of a profession and who architecture is serving and who it is not. Um, so, you know, I do think that there is going to be, um, you know, a shift in the way that students are now um, building new practices. I think that we have to um, confront the reality that you know, the ways in which we, um, again, ascribe value and prestige to different kinds of practices, different trajectories that people must, um, um, you know, that are highly revered and not always accessible and available, you know, thinking about um, the way, you know, as an academic, you know, so much of your credibility is based on the institutions and practices you're affiliated with. And think about, you know, uh, who can really go, who can really afford to work for um, some of the most, you know, esteemed practitioners, you know, of our moment in cities that are just um, extortionately, extortionately high um, cost of living. Who can afford to do that? Who can afford to um, engage in those internships, you know, either for free or very, very, um, you know, very minimal wage and therefore build a resume in that way. And I think, you know, we should be encouraging students to completely subvert that way of um, moving into the profession. And I think the more that we can ask our students to imagine new futures for the profession that are more inclusive um, and accessible and that move beyond um, the architect and, you know, the the sole practitioner who has the vision, I think the more diverse and rich um, and, you know, truly interdisciplinary and productive architectural education will be. So I think it's about, um, I know I've kind of gone on a tangent, not directly answered your question, but in terms of geography and barriers to entry, I think we're in a wonderful moment where, you know, the pandemic has made education everywhere. And of course, you know, there's a technological divide, but you know, it's more accessible now than uh, I've ever seen it. So I think the more that we can embrace that and the more that we can um, continue to allow multiple people from multiple sides of a conversation to come together and ask students to, um, to um, build new questions from those encounters and build new pathways for, um, you know, making an impact in the world, the, the better our profession will be. Thank you, Sarah. No, that was just wonderfully said. And I, I um, you really started, you know, started to, to table this idea of uh, um, accessibility and not just accessibility, but accessibility to all. And I'd like to, at this moment, just, uh, you know, mention the, the College of Architecture and Planning at CU Denver. That is one of our core missions and goals. Um, making architecture accessible to all. Um, and part of this, as we start to think about those pathways that you mentioned and um, moving through from uh, academia to the profession, a student to a professional, um, we know that licensure um, becomes a really sort of, uh, you know, a, a poignant uh, a milestone within that, within that journey. And so I'd like to, um, uh, begin to talk a little bit, um, get into talking a little bit about that transition um, from higher education um, to becoming licensed and so forth. Um, and we also want to make sure that we're still sort of keeping um, the this this perspective of how we can push more um, minority students to be able to achieve to, to to make this accessible to them as as a pathway. So at this moment, I'd like to. Um, uh, a direct uh, question here um, to uh, Mr. Jeremy Fretz from NCAR. We're so, so, so fortunate to have to have um, Jeremy with us here today. Um, Jeremy, I'd like to um, ask you in terms of addressing um, Jedi issues. Um, how is how is NCARB addressing this path, this path to licensure? And if you can also identify any uh, barriers that you see um, readily as, as, a, as a hindrance to licensure. Sure, um, and would you like me, we may have skipped over some of those, those data points that come first. Would you like me to, to share some of that, that data that NCARB has? Yeah, um, so please feel free to, to okay. share those and then you can address the questions. Okay. 
Um, and I know in, uh, I'm glad to be here with you and I'm gonna uh, rock it through some data, um, but I think one of the most important things I wanna share is that we do have our first as of, uh, the data is new and also our president is new. Uh, we have our first Latino president in the organization's history. And so um, diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, and justice have been uh, something that's been very important to NCARB and it is even a greater focus of Alfred's uh, priorities for his presidential year. Um, so at NCARB, we look at you know, the data and we've gotten pretty well known for our NCARB by the numbers uh, publication, which has just been released for this year. And so we, you know, we try to understand what the status quo is. You know, what is the best information that we can get? Uh, and what does it tell us about? And then that informs NCARB policies. And I wanna pull, I, looking at sort of the things we were talking about, I decided to add a little bit of information at the last minute. Oops, there it went. Um, and I want you to just look at the right hand, two right hand columns of architects and new architects. This is live from our website. But you can see as we look into the future that there is, you know, we're gradually seeing this percentage of sort of current architects uh, for women, for example, increase. But you can see in the new architects category, it's 41%. Um, so that balance is beginning to shift. Again, we'll look at a similar, uh, a similar chart down here for uh, white and non-white. And you see on the right-hand side, the current population of architects is 84% uh, white. But in, you know, as things are shifting, uh, it is 29% people of color. Now, I want you to keep that 29% in mind as we look at uh, some of the other data. Um, because that's where it gets interesting from the perspective of how firms can be involved in addressing Jedi. Uh, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, you know, we have been doing some things at, at NCARB to try and reduce the burden of, so particularly the time burden. Uh, and so, you, you know, like we've launched the IPAL option for additional uh, opportunities, reduce the retake policy, reduce the required AXP. Uh, hours and you know all of those towards making the process of licensure uh, more uh, more accessible to everyone really um, and we've gotten the average time to licensure down to 12 years uh, from graduation and we all know that there are many things that shape that right it might be your personal opportunities or your family life situation or any number of things that can shape the time to licensure but as we look at the time to complete the AXP we begin to see some differences by race. Uh, and so you'll see uh, actually that um, the time spent to complete uh, AXP is actually higher for uh, white candidates um, and than it is for anyone else. Uh, as we look to the next one of time to complete ARE, the story is a little different in that white candidates tend to pass the ARE uh, more quickly uh, on average. And again, that's not you know, there are so many factors that we have to take into account if we try and determine causality. And that's where we spend a lot of time on, you know, or beginning to spend even more time and effort on research and trying to understand the why. Why is this, you know, difference? Is it because of, uh, you know, family situation? Is it the type of employer? Is it, uh, you know, there's just any number of things that can be shaping that difference. And so then, you know, getting more to your question, we start to see that candidates identifying as a person of color make up 44% of the candidates that are testing, but only 29% of candidates who are completing the exam. And so that is, you know, a notable uh, gap between taking the test, starting the ARE and finishing all the divisions of the ARE and becoming licensed. Now, is that because, you know, again, we can't uh, we can't attest to what is the cause of that. We can only share with you, you know, this is the data. So, you know, the deeper question that we start to ask is what is the cause of this? And we've started to do that. And I think if I'm on track, the next slide talks about NOMA. Uh, we've we started to do this through our partnership with NOMA at the national level and started to ask those questions through the baseline on belonging survey. And what, and this is opinion coming back to us now uh, to sort of help begin to explain what might be the cause of those differences in the data. Uh, and so we find things like that Amer African American and Latino candidates find it harder to have a firm that supports their experience goals. 
they're more likely to be encumbered or they report that they're more likely to be encumbered by college debt, personal debt, family obligations. They're more likely to report challenges of gaining experience in some of those AXP practice areas. They're less likely to receive financial support from their firm toward the exam. And they spend more on test prep materials um, than other candidates. So, you know, this now starts to just begin to nibble at the edges of what might some of the causes be. Um, so I think that, uh, I think I've sort of come around to the, the questions that, that you ask, uh, but if you want, I can continue also with, you know, what NCARB is continuing to do, and then, you know, the things we suggest firms start to think about. Yes, please do, Jeremy. Okay. So just quickly, I know, you know, don't want to, didn't want to take a lot of your time, um, but NCARB is working to actively respond, understand some of the root causes of those problems through additional research and uh, on the ongoing partnership with NOMA is just one aspect of that research. We also have the Get On Board uh, program, which is about helping to prepare, uh, prepare diverse candidate pools of folks to join licensure boards because licensure boards are in each jurisdiction, in each state, uh, those boards are usually appointed by governors uh, and with you know, the level of rigor or familiarity with the needs of the architectural profession may vary between those governors uh, and of course, between political parties and everything else. Uh, but that's really where legislation happens for our profession. And so for our members, we work to uh, help develop that pool of candidates that is more diverse that's at ready to go uh, if the governor is willing to appoint them. We're also releasing new practice exams. We've really, you know, uh, Sarah, you talked about the cost of the programs and the cost of NCARB programs. We've started to understand a little bit that sometimes when candidates are talking about the cost of getting passing the ARE, they're talking about the $10,000 they spent on study materials as much as they're talking about you know, the $265 per, or $225 per test. Um, so, you know, we think that offering those practice exams will start to uh, help a little bit on that. Uh, and then we're doing some collection of real-time feedback and we have a fair, fairness and licensure work group that's actually looking uh, pretty at a pretty granular uh, level at all of our programs uh, to see what, uh, if anything, we can do there. We've also developed our free supervisor training, which I hope everybody's uh, aware of that you can take uh, on our website. And it addresses in that training, discrimination, equity, unconscious bias, and some of the topics that are included in there. That's free uh, HSWCE. And, um, you know, we uh, encourage folks to just be active in, in your firms in terms of meeting with your licensure candidates to review their progress. Uh, to recognize those unconscious biases, to know this data about the, the, um, the discrepancies that exist and that folks are experiencing. And then, of course, coming up, we have our analysis of practice, um, which you'll start to be asked questions about. And that's where the entire profession gets to shape what it is that we test and require for licensure uh, by telling us what you do in practice for real on a daily basis. So it's really important if you have the opportunity to participate in that. Thank you, Jeremy. And before we before we we move on, because we have a few more minutes, we have about four more minutes still for this segment. I'd like to just say it's um it's it's encouraging to um to learn of these initiatives that um, and CARB is, is, is engaging in, in terms of um, addressing this aspect of our profession. Um, you outlined, there were six items, right, that you outlined in terms of um, sort of active work that's that's going on. And I'd like to say um, that this, it's, it's very promising because we have all been in a lot of discussions and meetings and we really want to see things in action to you know, sort of meet very specific goals. So I appreciate seeing these six uh, um, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, in engagements that NCARB is actually you know, sort of uh, currently working in to, to, um, to get some, some real data. Um, I'd like to just ask about the, the last thing you, you did point out, the, the fairness in licensure group. Um, when we think of the word fairness, I feel like that can come with, uh, you know, a few different, you know, connotations. We might even have our own different perspectives about what is fair versus what is not. So how does, how does NCARB 
is it, are they defining it somewhere? Are they addressing it a very specific way? So tell me a little bit more about that, please. I'll do my best. Um, and it is, it's really looking at all of our programs and services through the lens of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And there are consultants involved who are, are experts, out of house experts, um, who are working with us on that. Uh, and looking at how, particularly how any, anything between uh, the AXP program and ARE pass rates, if there's any correlation uh, between those. So it's both looking to see, you know, are there, and we've done some initial work in this area already to say, you know, is there anything, uh, you know, we've had uh, our exam questions, for example, reviewed and, and validated, um, uh, you know, looking for, is there bias here somewhere, or is there an unintended consequence, or is there a word that's used in a way that you know is maybe interpreted differently. So all of those things are already in place, but this is you know looking deeper and particularly looking now into uh, the experience component, the thing that we're really talking about here today. And where is it that that breakdown happens? You know that yields some of the discrepancy. That we've seen. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, I got a note in the chat for something that uh, that we can deal with that addresses the issue of barriers to licensure. And AIA Colorado has the Licensure Advancement Fund. It was launched last year with the uh, full support of the Architectural Education Foundation to help candidates who are experiencing hardship along the path to licensure. It will pay a scholarship up to $500 to cover ARE exam uh, seat uh, reservations, um, those test prep materials, um, even maintaining your AXP record with NCARB or paying your fee to DORA when you want to um, actually apply for licensure. So just to plug out there for that, we still have those available for this year and we awarded, I think, 16 in 2020. Um, and then one other note that, that Jeremy prompted me on is NCARB is a, is a collateral. That's kind of, it's not collateral damage. It's a, it's a collaborative relationship. Uh, there are there are traditionally five anchor institutions that make up the profession of architecture. Uh, it's the National Council of Architectural Registration Board, which you know, set the standards for licensure and regulation. They're sort of the, uh, the regulators of the profession. AIA, of course, AIS, which is the students. We have the um, ACSA, ACSA, which is the Collegiate Schools of Architecture. So all the institutions that uh, Sarah and Nisha and others work at. And then NAB, which is the National Architectural Accrediting Board. And so they accredit all those schools of architecture uh, for their degree programs. And they do that on a five-year cycle of changing their standards and just did that last year or two years ago on updating those standards. In 2020, we added a sixth collateral to that group and that is NOMA. So now uh, NOMA is at the table with those five other organizations that meet on a regular basis, the presidents, the CEOs, um, and talk about issues relevant to the profession. So that's a relationship that that helps all of us and is a way for us to further advance these goals. Wonderful, thank you, Mike. And uh, the, the last thing I was going to say that that partnership with NOMA, I believe even at the um, national uh, level where I am involved also, but even at a local level is very, very, it's very near and dear to my heart in terms of being able to um, have a seat at the table, be able to have specific con uh, conversations with um, uh, uh, members of all professions, um, whether they be regulatory or the actual uh, sort of firm setting. So that's, I just wanted to say, which is why I'm very excited again that we're doing this today, because um, it's very important to be at the table um, yeah. to, you know, to have a, a really sort of meaningful discussion mm -hmm. when we talk about, you know, these topics of diversity. All right, so um, thank you, Jeremy. Um, thank you for, for all of the, um, the uh, uh, stats that you showed us. And I really want to encourage if there are students on the line, which I hope they are, mm -hmm. <laughs> we may be on summer break, but they know I always check on them. <laughs> make sure, please make sure you guys are, are, are really, you know, um, uh, taking advantage of these resources. Um, and I, I tell my students every day, bang on doors, pick up phones, mm -hmm. Say hi. I don't. I don't care what it is. Make sure that you're you're maintaining um, connections and networks, and show your you know show show that that interest. Um, so I appreciate that, uh, Jeremy. Thank you very much. All right. So we are moving into the segment where we want to talk about firm culture, um, and I have a series of questions that I'll be throwing out to the panelists. Um, we want to be very 
um, a cognizant of the time frame that we have. Um, so panelists, I'll be giving you an idea of, of how much time we have for each question, but um, uh, please feel free to, to share um, to share um, as much as, as you need to within that time frame. Before we do that, we want to share results from one yeah. of our polls. All right, um, and I believe everyone should be able to see to yeah, see so these results. This was the question we asked at the top of the webinar today, just so you know um, our audience today. So it's 62% um, female, 35% male. And then the diversity numbers on racial and ethnic are 3% um, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, 9% Asian, 12% uh, Black or African American, uh, white, Hispanic or Latino, that's 15%. Um, and then we've got 44% white and then a few others down the line. So just Hispanic, Latino, 6%, multiracial, biracial, 9% and 3% other. Our next question, how many years of professional experience do you have in architecture? Zero to five is about one fifth of our audience today. Six to 10, 15%. Another fifth is 11 to 15 years. Uh, we've got 15%, 16 to 20, 15%, uh, 21 to 30, and 31 plus years is 15%. So all kinds of experience levels identified today. And then the career stage, early career, 18%, uh, mid-career manager, 53%. Sole practitioner is 9%, principal and owner 18%, and then retired non-practicing is 3%. So some really diverse numbers today on our call and uh, really appreciate all those perspectives and thank you for participating in the poll. All right, so our first question uh, will be uh, directed to David. David, thank you for joining us today. Um, and also new to Colorado, so additional welcome there <laughs> for you and Sarah as well. I won't uh, uh, forget to, um, to acknowledge that. So, um, David, in terms of um, when we talk about higher education, um, we're going to transition from higher to from culture. Um, it has been said that it doesn't always prepare students for the culture of practice. Um, what are some ways that you found? Um, that both support and, and you know, sort of uh, closes that gap in terms of how they might be, you know, better prepared to transition to practice. Um, thank you, Anicia, for that question. Um, for me personally, coming into the profession um, out of academia that I found with my firm personally, that's what I want to speak on, um, is that my firm allows me to really bring my whole self to work. Um, and the way I find that they do the, uh, a great job at doing that is by me allowing me to have a voice. And um, a big way in which we do that is by in our Monday morning meetings, um, I've been allowed to you know, present things that really, um, should I say, mean the most to me in my career and where I wanna go um, forward in my career. You know, what, uh, what, what matters most to me in terms of you know, being involved in NOMAs um, through school, by me being able to voice that in one of our meetings, I was able to connect with a lot of my um, colleagues who gave me the resources to eventually find the NOMA uh, Colorado chapter and to build relationships through NOMA here and kind of have a home away from home, um, which was really big for me going through school because um, it was very hard to kind of find people who look just like me and who are going through the same um, challenges that I was experiencing. So um, I really appreciate that as well as um, we have a mentorship program where it doesn't matter how new you are to the profession or how experienced you are, everyone who starts here gets a mentor who is kind of your go-to person when you have those kind of burning questions about what might be bothering you or how to get you know, something voiced or if you have a strong opinion about how something was said, instead of going, you know, maybe you might not feel very comfortable going straight to leadership, you have that, that person who can maybe direct that um, question in the right direction or get the right people to get you the answers you need. So that's um, another thing that I would say is very important is kind of to find that one person that you can trust and go to, to get those answers that you want and, and put you in the position to succeed. You know, um, I think we also started up, um, there's a lot of committees 
at our firm and we've started up a Jedi committee where I feel like we've made a lot of strides in finding ways in which we have gaps, you know, finding, you know, opportunities, you know, um, coming out of school. Um, there's no such thing as kind of like, a, I guess, a group or organization expo as you would when you're, you know, a freshman in college that kind of lays out all the different, you know, organizations you can get involved with that kind of, you know, I guess, correlate with things that mean most to you. So um, I do think there's ways in which, you know, firms could um, listen to um, the individuals and their employees. That way they can take um, initiatives can be taken to kind of not have the person have to speak out at first, but they kind of already laid out um, ways in which you have a way to get involved in the experience or the things that you want to have experience in, as well as um, opportunities. I feel like um, firms can also you know, maybe do a better job at finding a way to help um, individuals find a new network of people. I think um, life is kind of a series of pools and you kind of, they kind of get bigger and bigger, you know, as you go from high school, from high school to college, college is a lot bigger, it's a lot more exposure, there's a lot more people. And then from, you know, academia into the profession, there's, you know, a lot more people, especially if you move to a new area, it's kind of hard to kind of make those connections, especially coming out of, you know, a pandemic and COVID and quarantine. It's kind of very hard to um, be social and connect with individuals. So I think firms could do um, a pretty good job at um, improving the way in which they connect their um, employees with other colleagues that they may, you know, find those connections and um, overlaps and experience and things that they want to be involved in. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> you touched on um, uh, the, the, the thought of, you know, seeing people that look Look like you within the profession. Um, we, I, I, I find that to be, you know, something that we need to, you know, sort of give some some additional, you know, air in, in understanding what that means to us. Um, this ties into my next question um, directed to Yisel, is culture of belonging. And when we talk about belonging, um, we are really wanting to understand um, why it's important, you know, to, to, to foster this culture of belonging. Um, and specifically when it comes to justice, equity, diversity, and in, um, inclusion. So we have about two minutes uh, for this question. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll try to sum it up in the way that I share my own Jedi story. So for me, the, the, what builds or the bedrock for a culture of belonging is understanding what justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion mean. So for justice, it means dismantling, we're first acknowledging that the system is inequitable and trying to dismantle all of the isms that hinder us from reaching that equity, like racism, ageism, um, all of sexism, all of the isms. Moving, I call it sort of the continuum from Jedi to belonging. So equity is the access to resources. So recognizing that not everybody arrives at the table with the same level of resources or agency. And that's really important. Diversity is recognizing, although for me, diversity is a fact, right? It's whatever, what makes up who you are. Uh, but in this context is sort of a recognition of your identity, the recognition of what, the, what diversity means for you when you show up to the table. Um, it is intersectionality of how all these things come together. It is the recognition that these things are valuable and needed and they need to be celebrated and acknowledged in the space that you're in, in any space that you're in. Um, Inclusion, uh, we all, we probably all heard, inclusion is not only being invited to the party, is being asked to dance, is agency, is feeling like you have a voice when you're already invited to the table. And that's pretty much uh, critical to the sense of belonging. And my favorite definition of belonging and how I sort of define that culture of belonging, which is beyond agency and the, the, the director of, of uh, I think it was head and, and development at IDO says belonging is not only being invited to the party, being asked to dance, it's only a freak frag fly. And I love the idea that it, it goes beyond the agency. It goes beyond acknowledging the table. It is you feeling like you can own the stage, you can own the table and you can dance however you wanna dance, that you're freak frag fly. And I kind of love that. And for me, a culture of belonging is understanding the systems that are in place 
dismantling the systems that create inequity, celebrating the things that we bring to the table, including everybody in it, and then feeling like we're all belong in the space equitably and genuinely. Wonderful. Thank you, Yusel. And you have no issues with me dancing. <laughs> <laughs> I figured. <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, Yusel, I'd like to uh, parlay that, your, um, your question and your response into this next question that I do have for you. You'll have about four more minute, uh, four minutes for this question, so a little bit longer. Um, so we see firms uh, currently increasing their diversity efforts um, and they're wanting to recruit more people of color. Um, how how do we be how do we go beyond just checking a box right to appear diverse on paper um how do firms allow employees to bring their whole selves yeah. so i'll i'll quickly reiterate what david said which i think he kind of answered the questions through his lens beautifully uh, firms need to provide people with platforms to share their stories authentically. They need to be intentional in mentorship opportunities and sponsorship, which I think David sort of mentioned, allowing the different pools uh, that you are able to tap into to build your, your um, leadership qualities and your own voice, um, access to opportunities. I will add intentionality. Uh, so making Jedi core to your firm strategy aligning Jedi to your efforts as you build your business values and your outcomes. So being very clear in how you're aligning these, these concepts or this mindset in, in getting embedded into every process within an organization. It is not an initiative, it is not a thing that you do, it's an intention that you place on all of the systems that you create within an organization. It is design, it is HR, it is talent acquisition, it is professional development, it is every building type and how you build your relationships with partners and how you create those relationships and stronger relationships with your clients, thinking ultimately that the, the deliverable on the product is uh, hopefully through mirroring of the community, creating a sense of belonging for our communities. So I think um, how you bring your whole self to the table is creating that, sa that safe space, a psychological safety within an organization where people feel like they are um, open to sharing their voice authentically, uh, to, to welcome the opportunity to challenge and be challenged without shame or blame, uh, giving everybody a lot of grace. Um, and also no retaliation because we all want to experience the space through a growth process and a growth man mindset. So if we allow ourselves to make the mistakes and learn from them and grow, and we give ourselves grace, then we build that space where everybody can really show up authentically and bring their whole selves to the table. Um, I'll, I'll also say, reiterate yet again, what both of you have mentioned, visibility and representation are critical. I know a lot of people say you can't be what you can't see. I think a lot of us become the things that we want to see because of the circumstance, but it is certainly easier to know where you want to get to if you can see it, then you can be it more clearly. So providing visibility in media, in your marketing materials, in, in your leadership structure, and providing that opportunity for succession planning to be very clear. So transparency is very important in how you share data. Uh, David also mentioned is that gap analysis, being very intentional in saying, I'm going to assess where we are, creating a baseline for the organization, making it transparent, and then celebrating the process that by, by which you decide um, to measure where you're going to get to. So goal set, uh, strategically move forward, um, allowing people to, to su uh, support and engaging to build their community, like through NOMA or AIA or whatever organization fits you best. And my favorite, celebrating Heritage Months, being very intentional in celebrating the people that do the work, that are there for you, that built your narrative and aligning them with your clients and the communities. I think that's very important um, to, to allow people to say, I can show up however I want to show up at the table. Thank you, Yusel and David. You you both uh, you know supported each other very beautifully there in terms of um, uh, your your responses, and they they did uh, also address my next question, which was more specifically about um, uh, um, uh, being able to as a as an emergent professional um, to 
to have a seat at the table. Um, David, if maybe one minute or so, if there's anything else you'd like to add to that, um, please feel free. Yes, definitely. And I feel, um, personally, I live my life kind of by, uh, I think Beyonce said it best, was just kind of like, um, chop down that wood and build that table yourself sometimes whenever you know um, you find yourself in a position or you may be working at a company or a firm that doesn't really give you that voice to um, or that seat at the table you kind of you know make your own path make your own way you know um, and then you know I think another side to it is also you know with firms I think recognizing are they really giving their employees an act or are they really actively listening to their employees are they um you know sending out surveys um to their employees to see you know what burning questions they may have or what they don't feel comfortable with that might be you know going on or hasn't been addressed correctly or hasn't been addressed at all you know things like that as well as um i would also you know like to address a lot of you know um, other emerging professionals on this call that um, be proactive in your interview process. You know, um, it's, it's much of an interview as as much as they're interviewing you, you're also interviewing them. So make sure you're you're proactive in the questions that you're asking and, you know, ask what does their, um, ask them to describe what does um, diversity mean to them? What is their, um, the diversity of the firm? Like what is the culture uh, of their firm um, look like? And uh, what does it mean to them? Um, and if you have an interview process where it's, you know, maybe a part one and a part two, maybe ask some of those questions again to see if you get the same answers. Um, because that, that way you can maybe quickly identify if before you even get into that situation of not having a voice, if you'll even, you know, be in a position to have a seat at that table or not. So, thank you. Thank you, David. And I especially appreciate it. Again, I'm gonna <laughs> make sure I, uh, uh, um, uh, encourage you know the students on the line right to, to really really take um, you know this information that you hear into heart. So um, my next question, yes, I'm going to come back um, to you on this one. Uh, we have about uh, three or four minutes again. Um, in terms of right, creating this this atmosphere, sometimes there are challenging questions um, that might be uncomfortable. They might be uncomfortable topics to address. Um, how, you know, without uh, being defensive or fear of repercussions, how, how do professionals in our field address this? How do, we, how, how do they approach it? That's a really good question. <laughs> uh, I think there are, I think it all comes down to how you acknowledge your self-awareness and how you acknowledge other people's awareness, like the otherness. Uh, so for me, when I, when I, get asked this question, I always think it comes down to education. It's, it's self-education and intentionality and in how you want to show up for other people. So if there is an acknowledgement that this conversation is uncomfortable for you, then educate yourself. And what firms can do is provide training and resources to educate, provide opportunities for people that uh, welcome the opportunity to share their stories and elevate that platform. But David also mentioned you have to provide people with choice, which I think is, is the most important thing. If you, if you need a space, an anonymous space to share a conversation, then firms should do it through surveys, anonymous platforms, or give people the choice to share opportunities to, for self-education um, and, and provide feedback firm-wide so people don't feel singled out. Um, I think the most important thing in this conversation on both ends, is there's no shame and blame in this conversation. We are here because of the system. Right? We're here because this is centuries of history. And we have to recognize that we are a product of that, whether, whether within the entire spectrum. So we all have bias. We all experience um, all of these things. Uh, we all are subject to social media. We react in certain ways. We're sort of programmed in many different ways because of all the input of information that we get. So there can't be any shame and blame, even if you're wrong, even if you feel like you've, you're doing something wrong, make the mistake, open yourself up, be, um, ask for grace and learn from, from the opportunity. Uh, but defensiveness is, is sort of the, the biggest crutch for, for this conversation is because you're not defensive, you're not listening. You're not open to the conversation. You're not open to receiving information that can help you grow. And I think that's the most important thing. We're all within this continuum. So 
all these questions will be challenging for years to come. This conversation will be challenging for many years to come. So you just have to be open to it, not be fearful and welcome the opportunity to be challenged. And Giselle, uh, speaking about challenges, um, as we're, we're having this discussion now and the, the importance of belonging, um, for those that are, aren't in this room today <laughs> with us, how do we engage them? Um, what, what do we say to our peers who don't think there's a change that's needed? I, I, will, I would likely, well, there are many ways to tackle that issue. <laughs> there are many ways to tackle that issue. I, I get that question a lot for emerging professionals and um, people entering the profession. And I say the first thing you, the first thing I encourage is to, you have to build your village. You have to figure out who your allies are, the people that are leading this conversation, engaging in these panels, reaching out to, to people and using data. The data, and Jeremy shared a ton of data. There's also data from NAB that shows what the future of our industry is going to look like. Um, I think not counting um, non-resident alien, which is the, the terminology that is used by, by NAB, it's less than 50% of people that are graduating with, um, with architectural degrees from that. It's 48% of white people graduate. If you count uh, predominantly white institutions and, and minority servicing institutions, if you count um, non-resident aliens. Uh, the Pew Research notes that one in four Gen Zs are Hispanic. 35% uh, know somebody that identifies as they and that. That's the future of our industry. We know through research by Forbes, well-managed diverse teams outperform any other team. So if you are in path to leadership, if you're currently a leader, this is the demographic that you're having to lead. So you have to understand who they are, how they traverse the world, what their expectations are and their values are, and this is exponentially moving forward. This is not slowing down by any means. The future of our industry, the future of the world is increasingly diverse. So I always say, figure out what your leadership, what jives with your leadership. If it's the ROI, we'll hit them with the innovation and business side. There is a direct correlation that diversity is a key driver to innovation. Look at that. Show what um, Glassdoor is doing. Glassdoor, now um, it will allow, if you have more than five reviews in our certain demographic, uh, Glassdoor will allow um, any future employee or current employee to sort through race and gender. So if the organization isn't doing it, other systems are doing it and exposing whatever it is that your culture truly represents. So you wanna really be proactive. And as a person that maybe you don't have agency, show them what is happening in the industry. Um, build a, an employee resource group, talk about this data, present it in a lunch and learn. Um, try to not shame and blame, but show that this is the future and bring other people into the conversation and, and really show that to be a truly inclusive leader, this is, this is the acknowledgement and this is the future if you want to make it to the top. If you want to be a truly resilient firm, you have to do this. This is it. Wonderful, thank you again, Giselle. Um, we have one more question uh, for the entire panel. So I'll give everyone a chance to, um, to, to contribute a response. Um, uh, so we have members of at every level that are, are present on this call as we just uh, saw from the poll. Um, how can we all contribute uh, to being uh, better allies and creating a more inclusive environment. And please free, feel free anyone if you're ready to, to jump in. So we really jump in the different rules here. Thank you, go ahead, sir. <laughs> okay, sorry. I think one thing, and I, I um, really enjoyed hearing um, the ways that, you know, Jeremy, David and Yazel are navigating their respective um, careers and offering mentorship to people who are grappling with some of the questions that you've put forth. 
Um, and I think, you know, um, it was mentioned um, in Giselle's last response about, you know, mm -hmm. resident aliens and some of, you know, what does it mean to be a person who's in a more precarious position and how can we offer, um, you know, mechanisms through which they can be more supported to take those risks to, you know, potentially jeopardize a relationship with people who are in positions of power to ask difficult questions, like who has the most at stake and how can we, you know, provide, you um, you know, safety cushions for them. And this goes back to the conversation about NCAB when, you know, um, and I am super excited to hear that there is more generous acts being made to, you know, not only through AIA with the financial um, incentives, but also by making tests um, available online. But ultimately, it's like, how do we support the, the people who are most vulnerable in our profession? How do we support people who are not, you know, um, on the who are so far removed from an even um, playing field that we're trying to build um, and make this more, um, make ways that are more conducive for them to participate and to make the change that we're all trying to, um, to talk about or trying to um, realize. So yeah, that's my, that's my response. Uh, thank you, sir. I, I... You bring up a, a, a very good, a very good point that the, it's acknowledgement. To me, how, how do we show up better for other people is acknowledging that we are all different, that that we have different circumstances that we need to navigate, and that um, everybody, everybody, every story is worth being told. That everybody has a unique perspective, unique challenges and also unique opportunities to bring to the table. So for me, it's it's letting my freak flag fly all the time, uh, being comfortable and sticking my foot in my mouth and being challenged and being questioned, um, being visible as much as, as much as possible. I also do all these things like Puerto Rico. I have my love sign over there. Being willing, be willing to be out there, be open and, um, no, no, I, and I don't want to presume that we're not, nobody's monolithic, right? There is an intersectionality to all of us, but that it is really important to share all the pieces of who we are and how we got to where we are and build that level of confidence for ourselves because we do that for other people when we do that for ourselves. So for me, it's just showing up, showing up at the table and learning from the experience and then pulling everybody behind you and pulling them up. Yes, yes. Um, and to piggyback off of Yazelle and Sarah, um, I totally agree with that. And I believe, you know, representation is so important. Um, I will speak to a lot of emerging professionals. Um, be seen, you know, get in the position to, to be seen. Um, anytime there's an opportunity for you to, you know, be on a panel such as this, or to, you know, get active in a certain organization, a certain committee, um, committee or your community, do that because it, it, you never know who's watching, you know? So, um, and for me, I love to, you know, always reach back. I always love to think about, you know, where I came from. It's always think, you know, um, how can I help, you know, when I was in school, how can I help the freshmen get into the position that I'm in um, as a senior or as a junior? And how can I give them tips and tools on how to, you know, navigate a space that they're new to, but I've kind of already gone a little further down the path. So I believe, but they won't know that you're there unless you, you know, be active in trying to be seen, you know, be active, you know, be in the pictures, be, be in the front, um, make sure if you're, you know, not on the company website, make sure you, you get on there because a lot of times, especially um, when coming out of school and you're, you know, you're looking for a firm that you, you may want to work at, they do great work, you know, you maybe go to that about page, that team page, and you, you know, you look for, you know, what does their leadership look like? What is, um, what is their, you know, culture? Uh, what is the culture of belonging, you know, um, look like at that firm? So a lot of those things are very important to um, be mindful of, especially once you get, you know, either a seat at the table or you are in that position to be mindful that, you know, others are watching and that you are important to other people's success as much as your own, so. Wonderful, thank you. Jeremy, did you just wanted to make sure and see if you had anything you needed to add? Because we do have uh, some questions uh, from the audience, and one of them is uh, specific to NCARB. So, but I want to give you a chance on the last question if you. If you well, have I uh, 
you know, I was sitting here thinking about it, uh, leave it to the white dude to be the last word. That's no fun. That's not the way it ought to be. Um, but I think, uh, what, you know, I think as a white dude, I think middle-aged white dude, I think being willing to venture boldly in and make mistakes with the intention of trying to, to be an ally and being ready to get it wrong and, um, you know, and, and just deal with it, just suck it up and deal with it. Um, so um, I think stand up for your colleagues and for those, you know, around you and sometimes just sit down and shut up. Thank you, Darby. Um, we do have some uh, uh, questions that we'd like to uh, get entertained from the audience. And um, before we go into that, um, my co-host and co <laughs> here, Mike has some reactions um, just to the uh, questions and responses and he's gonna share those now. Yeah, this is a great conversation today. Uh, capably moderated, of course. Um, but before we get to the to the audience questions, um, just some some reactions that I took just watching all this great talent share what they've been through. Um, and a few notes on how to be better allies. So just an acknowledgement that that good intentions can be wrongly executed. Um, but it's important for everybody involved to recognize that the intentions are good. Um, so one thing I've seen is when management of a firm asks the person who looks different to start the EDI committee. Um, probably comes from a good place, but is not the right result. So when you find that you've done something like that, you know, bad news is not like fine wine. It does not get better with time. So apologize as soon as possible when a mistake has been made, acknowledge that you didn't know better um, and ask them to help you get better. Um, and then move on to say, well, what would help us as a firm from your perspective to move the needle on this? Um, another thing is I, I really think we're moving from a point in time when it's not just enough to check boxes of what you will not do, but what we will do. Um, and I, I think um, particularly about how you create this environment in which people can work and bring them whole, their whole selves um, you know, a growth mindset is the opposite of a zero sum. If you say, um, by choosing to do this, we are limiting ourselves from doing something else, usually and is more powerful uh, than or. So try it. Um, you can always say, we'll go back to the way things were before it, if it doesn't work. And as employers, you don't want people who are self-regulating into a diminished version of who they are uh, in your workplace every day. And so if you have people who are, who are voluntarily checking themselves from bringing their whole person to the workplace and you notice uh, that, that they either aren't comfortable or they're too quiet, um, that's not to say uh, introverts aren't valuable, um, quiet is perfectly okay too. But if you see that their personal life is different from their professional life uh, in which they aren't as vital in the office as they are in the rest of their life, um, have that conversation say, is there something here that we are doing that, that is holding you back? Because you don't want people to self-regulate themselves until they find the next job where they can bring um, their vital selves to the work. Um, Giselle mentioned baseline is important and measurements are important. So just, to, just a note to say, in our awards, we are now asking those questions of representation and firm makeup um, in all the award submissions. And the jury doesn't see that, by the way. It is not to judge them. But we thought it was important to see who among those of our membership who are doing the best work uh, in the AIA, how are they building firms and teams and practices? And then we'll look at that over time and hopefully the award winning firms compared to those who don't win awards will prove out that this stuff works. Uh, oh, speaking of data, time to licensure getting down to 12 years, that's huge. It takes a lot of things working in concert to move that number down uh, because it's a huge universe of people that are affected by that behavior. But it still is the case if you're, uh, my daughter has graduated from architecture school. She's in the practice now. Um, she is more likely by average age to have a grandson or granddaughter for me before coming home with a license and saying, I did it. That's crazy. <laughs> We've got to fix that. Um, and I'm, I would love to have one, but I'm not in a hurry to have any grandchildren. Um, I would rather she get her license first. Um, and for 
people who go into progress. I love the analogy, David, of the progressively bigger pools and, um, you know, from high school to college to profession. And um, uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to embarrass you in any stretch here, but um, you had a lot of questions about why am I invited on this panel? Um, what am I going to contribute to the conversation? Are you sure I'm new to the state? I, you know, I'm new to um, even working in the practice. Um, whatever pool you're in now, um, we expect you to be a big fish in a big pool. Um, and we see you and we thank you for participating. Um, so on the note of being seen, see this guy. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, Jeremy, I, I think it's great that you know NCARB is addressing the issues of diversity. They're not they're not new to the new to the party, of course. It's just the the barriers to getting to NCARB leadership are baked in in the sense that most of these practice acts say you need to be appointed by a governor with ten years experience. So who is likely to have ten years experience and be able to know the governor to get an appointment? It's going to be firm principals who have been around for a long, long time. Those are white guys. Um, it's just a fact of life, but that's changing um, as our practices are made up. So I loved Alfred's quote about how he looks forward to the day when we no longer have to call out the first, second, or third fill in the blank. I'm really looking forward to the day when we no longer have to prefix women, African-American, Latino, uh, openly LGBTQ, architect. And let's just say architect, period. <laughs> Um, right now, if you say the word architect to anybody in the public and even in the profession, the connotation comes to mind that it's none of those types of people. You know, it's, it's a gray haired white guy with a black turtleneck who has cool glasses. Uh, so <laughs> let's just say, get rid of the prefixes. Architects are very diverse and bring a lot of things to the table. And finally, I loved how Sarah started and I think your questions are really the heart of this. Who gets asked access to this profession and who gets access to those professionals? Now that's got an upside and a downside to it. It's provocative in the sense that we're not where we want to be, but if we keep on this path and this journey together, it will open up all kinds of new markets. It will make those firms more attractive to employees. It'll make those firms more attractive to potential clients because the future is more diverse more innovative, more engaging, broader perspective, and has a rich uh, breadth of talent that's out there waiting to come from schools like UCD, where 60% of their undergraduates are non-majority. Wonderful. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> it's a really, um, really poignant um, notes to reflect on, and I'd like um, uh, to um, let the pa panelists know we do have questions coming in um, from the audience and we have about 10 more minutes um, to address those questions. Um, and Jeremy, we'll start with you. Um, the first question. Let's move this a second here. So uh, I believe that was the question about the five-year rolling clock for yes. Yes. whether that has an unintended negative consequences. Yes. And mm -hmm. I, I tried to get um, to get Harry Falconer or Jared Zern, who are the two VPs uh, who are on that task force, uh, uh, and I wasn't able to reach either of them. So for now, my answer is I don't know. Um, and to the best knowledge of everyone I was able to chat with, uh, we don't think that's been studied specifically yet, but it is the kind of thing that you know would come out of the Fairness and Licensure Task Force, and now like four people have Slack messages about it. So. <laughs> your suggestion has been passed on. And there was a follow-up, Jeremy, um, to that question. And, it, um, and the uh, audience member wants to know if, uh, has NCARB given any thought to add in any other study materials as included in part of your NCARB membership dues? Um, or thought of partnering with any third party vendors to offer access for free or at a discount with an NCARB um, membership? Um, yeah. so, Groups like Black Spectacles or Amber. So we do have our approved test prep providers, which is not a discount. It's just uh, uh, people who have asked us to look at their content and you know approve whether or not it meets the publicly available test spec. Uh, and so we say yes or no um, for those. But in terms of developing our own study materials or you know sort of partnering with somebody. 
Um, at present, we see that as more of a conflict of interest. Uh, we need to keep you know, the process of writing the exam uh, quite separate from helping people study for the exam. Um, so, you know, I, I do always encourage people to look at, you know, everything that's on that's, you know, the, the type of content that's going to be on the exam is specified uh, clearly in our documents and also the things you should hopefully have gained experience in are in the AXP. Um, so I really encourage people to to look to those resources. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, next question. Um, we do have a question for, for David. Um, please uh, describe how you heard about architecture and initial steps towards your early, early goals. Uh, I guess I'll go back a little bit with that one. Um, I've kind of always knew I wanted to be um, an architect, um, very little. Um, I don't know if y'all remember the show, Bob the Builder. Um, that was one of my favorite uh, cartoon shows growing up. So um, I initially got kind of exposed to, you know, the built environment, uh, construction and things of that nature. And I really loved to draw when I was younger. I get that talent from my mother. So um, eventually I got into drawing houses over and over. And then um, someone introduced to me, I think, um, around middle school that um, that's what a lot of, you know, our architect does, you know, they, they draw the plans for, you know, the buildings that we see in our everyday life. So I was like, okay, that seems pretty cool. And it wasn't honestly until um, I was in high school that I was, one of my good friends um, told me about design day at um, the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, um, where you kind of go in and you get experience to what architecture is and what that school's program is like. Um, and ever since that day, I fell in love with architecture. I fell in love. Um, my mentor, my professor, Kawana McCullen, she was there and she, um, I just, she really made me feel like I would be in good hands if I went to that school. Um, and that program was, um, it was right for me. So from there, and then, um, I forgot the second half of the question, but, um, what was the second half of that question? Just in, in, in terms of sort of your first thoughts of uh, um, initial steps. Of, uh, wanting to do architecture, what were some of your initial steps towards that? Yes, so um, my initial steps, I kind of always think of, um, I play a game of chess, not checkers. So I'm always thinking about um, what resources can I use to get um, what I need and, and where can I, who can I use and, and how can I use my network to best um, put me in the best position to succeed um, and get to those places that I want to get to. So, you know, going through school, it may have been, you know, getting a graduate assistantship. So I would make sure that I was constantly, you know, talking with a lot of um, upperclassmen so that I can understand, um, you know, how does this professor, you know, go about teaching this class? Um, who do I go to if I have questions about a wall section? Who do I go to um, if I have questions about how to get involved in a certain organization or how, you know, even to have a work life balance, you know, things of that nature. So I'm always kind of thinking about, you know, what, where do I want to go? Always, I feel like you always have to have in your mind, you know, who do you want to be and where do you want to go? And if you understand that, then I believe that you can start to soon identify the certain people in your, in your network that can help you get there. Um, I think experience is the best life teacher. So um, find those people who have that experience in the areas you want to go. Thank you so much, David. And I'm very glad that question was asked um, because even, you know, uh, an event like this right now that we're, we're in this discussion, there might even be, you know, apprehension to even ask that question. <laughs> uh, during this time, um, you, you reminded me of a of a session that I was asked to speak in really quickly. Um, I'll say it was a group of uh, young, um, young girls. Um, they belong to a group called Athletics and Beyond. And I thought, well, how do I talk to them about mm -hmm. architecture? And I just talked to them about myself and where I came from, and it sort of went into architecture. And at the end of that, a little hand went up. I couldn't even see her face. She was so short in the crowd. She was eight years, I believe eight or nine years old. And she said, ma'am, my name is so-and-so. Um, I would like to be an architect. What advice can you give, give me to take home to my parents so that they know how to prepare me to get into architecture? So sometimes we just need to know what those initial steps are. Um, so thank you, um, 
for the audience member that asked that question. And David, thank you for sharing. All right, we have um, uh, time for a couple more questions. So the, the next question um, uh, we, um, that I'd like to share. So uh, the audience member wants to know if there are um, any panelists, um, if you could share experiences or observations of situations that were not handled well, that you can um, tell us, you know, that might be more effective, a, a more effective response or a way to foster a better environment that would bolster positive approaches. And where, um, you know, we could think of this in, in terms of, you know, the working situation um, or maybe in, in academics as well. But would anyone like to address that? Don't, don't share names. Yeah. <laughs> I can jump in very quickly. And I think, um, you know, not just in the profession, but in academia, it's so important to cultivate a culture of transparency. And I think, you know, in doing so, you know, a really important component of that is being really open and frank about things that are you know, sometimes difficult to engage, like money and um, uh, money and status and access to opportunities. Um, for you know various members of you know the academic community, and um, you know I think that also goes back to and I'm, I'm I'm obviously skirting around the the part about you know where you know the personal relationship to or the personal experience in that, but I think you know uh, at the firms I have worked at, there's definitely been a huge discrepancy in pay um, between myself um, and people at a similar level, but you know, with a different um, background. And I think that's, you know, that wasn't exposed until either after the fact or much later um, into working at the various firms. And I think that's, you know, it created a lot of animosity, a lot of tension, and, you know, uh, it erodes uh, your self-worth when you're not being paid as much as your peers to do the exact same work. So I think that's super important. And um, in the last um, part on that, I think it's also important to think about, you know, the amount of time and energy that we invest, which has been spoken about multiple times and how that's, you know, it's fantastic. It's been reduced to 12 years. But, you know, all of this is, you know, is what we're getting paid commensurate with what we're putting in. So how can we, um, you know, how can we leverage the agency that we have through AIA, NOMA, all of these different regulatory boards or bodies to ensure that architects' time and value is um, being acknowledged and um, respected. So I think that's a great way that we can, um, you know, build a culture of belonging when people know that their um, their time and energy is tracked with the respect that it needs. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, again, for any panelists, um, since diversity at the university level doesn't match uh, what we're seeing in terms of licensed architects, how do you think um, we can change the supervisor role of AXP to address minority support? Um, how can firms give more support for the AXP slash ARES for minorities? So uh, I will venture into this one. Um, you know, I think it is the same way that you give more support to any AXP candidate um, in that, you know, you're in, you need to be intentional uh, about mentoring and about your staff. Um, I had a, a recent conversation with uh, some leaders at an organization that were you know, just the idea that they would talk with their staff about their goals and their development was sort of foreign to them. Um, and, you know, uh, so, and that particularly in architecture firms is, is often, you know, you do your once a year review that you have to do for something. And, um, you know, it's really about being more intentional as, as a mentor and uh, a leader helping support your candidates. Another thing that we've heard of, uh, and I heard this um, first or second hand, but it was a, a real experience that someone had had is, you know, that a um, you need to be more sensitive to the particular barriers that your, uh, that your licensure candidates of color may be experiencing. Uh, and then the, the story that I heard was someone who had, um, you know, been sent to a job site to, to document, do some existing field work. And it was in a neighborhood where, you know, this candidate knew 
they might have the cops called on them, you know, even there in their suit and tie and hard hat with the tape measure, uh, just because of the color of their skin. Uh, and being aware as an employer that that might be a real situation that someone experiences. And also as a candidate, being willing and brave enough to tell your supervisor that that's a concern or an issue you might have. On those supervisors and, um, and mentors need to stand up in those situations where people yeah. look. I mean, you've got to be not just an advocate that helps guide them through the process, but when you bring um, a minority architect to a, to a job site and they think that they're with the contractor or builder, um, mm -hmm. or you bring a woman who's pursuing licensure and they ask interior design questions, you've got to say, this is a future architecture. Treat them with respect. They're with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a very poignant. And I think that, um, you know, when we talk about allyship and being able to, you know, to stand up for the next person, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're, um, they, they are part of your team. They're part of your leadership, part of your future, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of a, a culture at your firm. I think that if one does it and the next person does it, <laughs> imagine mm -hmm. by the time we get to all, right, yeah. of us, what, what, what an impact that can make. So, and I, I say that very, uh, um, from a very um, personal perspective, because I have experienced that, mm -hmm. but <laughs> it takes a lot to deter me. <laughs> yes. and, and I'll add a, another plug for our supervisor training course, because it is, you know, it's designed to be, um, it's designed to provide, you know, training on how to be a better mentor. Uh, but it very intentionally has that equity and justice content built in, uh, including a version of the story I just told you. All right, we have um, uh, just a, a minute or two here before we have um, some closing comments here. And I'd like everybody to know this is not the end of this conversation. There will be many follow-ups. Um, so our last question, um, could or should metrics be developed like lead to establish and acknowledge the level of work that a firm is doing in the Jedi anti-racist space? And this is directed to any of our panelists. Well, I will, I will share quite quickly that there are several organizations that are looking at this in different ways that they currently are frameworks. So AIA has design measures. They have designing for equitable communities. LEAD does have a social equity piece. The large firm Roundtable is developing um, a JEDI and LFRT JEDI advocacy guide. I'm, I'm helping with that. The guides for equitable practice are there. Uh, and I think you we, we sort of mentioned before, you have to have a baseline. Whether you align it with policy link, LEAD, just, seed, whether you align it with any system, it's a start. So I think once the organization has that mindset that they're willing to look at the data, establish uh, an accountability through the data, and then look at goals, that's, that's where it needs to start. I don't, I keep getting these questions all the time. So where's the checklist? Where's the checklist? The premise for this, for this conversation is there is no checklist because we're all within a continuum in this conversation. So if I give you a checklist, I'm already presuming that I know where you are and I know where you need to go. We can give guides and we can encourage and we can align with different frameworks, but it's a matter of picking one, starting there and moving forward once you learn from that space. That's my perspective on it. Thank you, Yusel. Um, and just wanna let everyone know we, Sincerely appreciate your time and the time you're spending with us here today. Um, we do have one more question that we would like to, to um, table. So it, it will be the last question, but um, very uh, uh, timely in terms of um, our two groups meeting here today between AIA and NOMA Colorado. So can you give us ideas of how AIA and NOMA can more efficiently reach out to male leadership about this topic? 70% of AIA Colorado members are male, yet only 35% of participants today are male and only 18% principal participants. Yeah, and that dovetails nicely with another question that mm -hmm. says, do panelists have suggestions for ways to encourage our firm leaders to watch this webinar via the recording if they didn't get to participate today or didn't think they had anything new to learn? So um, along both of those lines, it is recorded and we will make it available um, for anyone to watch. Um, all of our recordings that we do through this platform are free to members. 
Um, and um, the, the secret is, not so dirty secret is, um, the recordings are on YouTube, so they're free to anybody after the fact. Um, if you're not a member, you have to pay at the front end. But um, so more to the first question, um, th more to come. I mean, this is just the start. We had a great conversation that this was a springboard um, that led to this today last year. Um, and I've had several, I know there's familiar faces on this panel um, in the chat. So um, just continue the conversation. This is the first of what we hope will be a long-term partnership between NOMA and AIA Colorado. And uh, one of a series of joint conversations uh, happening this summer. So we have two more in the works uh, that will be on our AI Colorado calendar, um, brought to us by our JEDI committee of AI Colorado. Um, and the, the challenge is going to be to reach people who don't think they need this information. Um, and that's pretty tricky. I mean, I'll fully acknowledge that if you're not, if, if the roles are a diffuse power situation where someone has the power and someone does not, it's hard for the person who does not have the power to say, you should do something, you should do anything, right? Um, but I think if it's, if it's phrased in the way that I really learned a lot from this, um, more about here is what I got out of it. Here are the benefits that I found. It was worth me spending this time. Um, this is, these are the takeaways I got rather than, I think you would learn a lot from this, right? So if it's an attraction, if it's an invite, everything needs to be by invitation, not by obligation. So that would be one way I would say to the particular point of encouraging people to watch this after the fact who may not have had time. Um, and then to say, if you like that one, there's more, um, I'll be sure to let you know about the ones that are coming up in the future. Or you could even have um, suggest a conversation slash watch party in the firm where I saw this, it was really great. Hey, can we talk about it at our next all hands staff meeting and maybe watch it and all have some questions ready to go. So those are just some ideas. Yeah, no, great ideas, Mike. Um, I actually know of, I won't say names, I actually know of one firm that did send out you know an invitation like that um, to their firm members and by invitation I'd like to also encourage everyone to um, you know just really think about this this term belonging I um, was in a recent uh, meeting actually a faculty meeting and um, it was shared it was a TED talk by social scientist and author Brene Brown she was talking about what it really means to belong and she had an interesting distinguish uh, you know sort of perspective where we think about belonging versus fitting in and what she really said is to belong you think about bringing you right you bring your skills your talents your experiences all of that really starts to sum up what it means to belong and we should really you know sort of adhere to to that understanding um, and 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 that what you know that's all that contributes to, to to diversity and even more but if we don't bring that how how will we know um, so I just wanted to, to share that I pay close attention to words and terms and just you know really like to get to the heart of, of the meeting of them. So um, we'll have, uh, before we close out, we'll have some uh, closing um, some closing remarks um, from uh, Mike, and then um, we'll end the session. So Mike, I'll let you take okay. it over. Well, first, thanks to our co-host, uh, both personally and organizationally, Anisha and Noma for putting on this presentation today. Um, like I said, more to come, and of course, our panelists were, were tremendously useful and inspiring. Giselle, David, Sarah, Jeremy, um, fantastic work. It's always a pleasure hearing more from you and about you and the future is bright. Um, as we wrap up this virtual connect webinar, um, the creative and inclusive fields to more inclusive built environments um, is a meaningful discussion that cannot be concluded in any 90 minute session. So. Um, we are committed to improving the physical, emotional, and so social well-being of occupants. It's really what you sign up for when you get your license. Um, you know, health, safety, and welfare is multidimensional, and it includes not only creating a good place for your building's occupants that you're designing for, but an environment in which to create those designs uh, in your firms. So I want to thank members here today for taking time out of your busy schedule. Summer's crazy. It's after a holiday. I know you probably had a bunch of other things to do, and just thanks so much for being uh, part of this, the commitment you made just to set that time aside um, means that we can expect more good things for you as this conversation progresses. Um, 
And then, uh, like I said before, we've got more conversations happening. On July 21st, we have a virtual connect featuring the State of the Association Address for 2021. And we have more on diversity inclusion featuring our second in the JEDI webinar series on August 4th, which is entitled Turning Words into Action, JEDI Resources to Help Firms Create Meaningful Change. And then we've got a third one to be determined later this year on uh, continuing education. So how as an individual, um, you can continue to educate yourself on these topics as you progress in your career. So thanks again, all of our panelists and presenters and co-hosts and to all of you for, for being with us today. Have a great rest of the week and we'll see you again soon.